But the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it also has a very important um, line that we should mention. It says, with the Orthodox Churches, this communion between the Catholic and Orthodox Church is so profound that it lacks little to attain the fullness that would permit a common celebration of the Lord's Eucharist. And so there's so much in common between the Catholic and Orthodox Church. They have a valid bishops, a valid priests, a valid sacraments. But what's separating us is that we're not, they're not in union with the Roman Pontiff. Um, they also, we'll talk about this with regard to the Church of England, that one of the first things to go in terms of belief and practice when the group separates from the Catholic Church is um, the Holding to the words of our Lord, it's actually the gospel for this coming Sunday, that divorce is that has never been a part of God's original plan for marriage. And so that is also one of the big doctrinal differences in the Orthodox Church is that they allow for divorce and remarriage. Alright, so that's the Orthodox. Um, the next big point is the Protestants. This uh, Reformation, this Protestant Reformation. The schism um, took place starting around the year 1517, um, starting with Martin Luther, also with John Calvin. Um, so how can we summarize this? Well, the main difference between, uh, one of the main differences, I mean, there's a whole list, but one of the main ones is that they only acknowledge baptism as one of the sacraments of the church, of the new Israel. And even on this, there's much disagreement on what baptism does. Um, and so I would give you a list of all of Protestant churches, but there's 40,000 of them, and the number's growing, so don't want to be here all night. Um, so there is this hyper-fragmentation that we see within the Protestant church, something that's very unfortunate. Um, we've seen the need, especially for the magisterium and the apostolic succession, that when there is not one leader over the entire assembly of the Church of Christ, how can we come to a common um, agreement upon what the solution is? So Lutheranism, Calvinism, Anglicanism, the Church of England, these were the first three um, of these schisms that took place in the 1500s. Um, Anglicanism largely, as you've probably heard, because um, of King Henry VIII, desiring to divorce his current wife. And as I already mentioned before, how divorce is one of the first things to go when a group of people breaks off from the Catholic Church. Um, but we must, we should also mention that Protestants retain the sacrament of baptism because there's not, I mean, even Catholics today, we believe that anyone can baptize anyone as long as they um, you know, in an emergency situation, they intend to do what the church intends to do. So I'm not recommending, I'm certainly not recommending, it's actually forbidden to go and baptize people just willy-nilly uh, in a non-emergency situation. But let's say if there was an emergency in a hospital, a Muslim could baptize someone to be a Christian as long as they intended to, intended what the church intends by baptism. And so because there's so uh, little requirement for um, the minister in an emergency situation, the Protestant church would still have a valid baptism as long as they intend to do what the church intends to do by baptism. And so there's the requirement of, it, of them using the proper formula, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, something that we see within scripture um, itself, like from the Great Commission that I read earlier. So they retain scripture and baptism. Those are the two things that the Protestant churches retain. But they lack uh, oneness, Catholicity, and apostles. That they don't have the oneness, they don't have the unity and the magisterium that comes from that. They're um, not Catholic in the sense of universal. These are um, largely, you know, Lutheranism started in Germany, Calvinism in uh, Geneva, Anglicanism within England. These are largely bound by language and ethnicity. And they're also not apostolic. They don't have apostolic succession. 
because they don't have holy orders, they don't have the priesthood. And so there's no bishops, there's no priests, there's no deacons um, within the Protestant churches. And so going back to the original question of who has the Eucharist, the Protestant churches do not, um, they have no ability to confect the Eucharist because there's no, uh, there's no holy orders, no bishop, priest, or deacon. Okay, so I mentioned how with the Orthodox churches, how the Catechism says that there is little uh, preventing them from full union with the Catholic Church. This is what the Catholic, the Catechism says regarding Protestants. Um, it says, those who believe in Christ and have been properly baptized are put in a certain, although imperfect, communion with the Catholic Church. And so even here, we have to acknowledge that when someone is baptized um, by anyone, they're brought into communion with the Church, but maybe to different degrees. If it's if they're baptized by a Catholic priest and tend to be with the Catholic Church in times by baptism, that's the full communion with the Catholic Church. But if someone is baptized um, by a church that's not in full communion with the Catholic Church, then they do have a communion, but it's an imperfect communion the catechism says. All right. So I'm just going to mention this briefly. Uh, some of you may have heard of communities like SSPX, um, Society of the St. Pius X, um, maybe also the FSSP, the Priest of the Trinity of St. Peter. Um, in Maryville, there's a group of priests called this to Christ the King that celebrates the Latin Mass. How do we uh, figure out all of this? Well, we're not going to figure it all tonight, but I just want to give you a couple pointers, especially since, um, you know, not even very far from here, there is uh, an SXPX uh, group that celebrates the Mass. And so often it's not un uncommon to receive questions regarding that. So I just want to offer a few points on that. So the Society of uh, St. Pius X, it was established in 1970 by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. Um, and so the reason for it was that he wanted, he disagreed with some of the kind of controversial points that were um, proclaimed at the Second Vatican Council, particularly on humanism, religious liberty, the collegiality of uh, bishops, um, and the way that's uh, played out with regard to the Pope and also on the subsequent liturgical reformations that took place after the council. Um, and so there's a lot of controversy in this, and depends who you ask, you're going to get a different question. But the um, Catholic Church's view of this is that the sacraments that they celebrate are valid but illicit. Um, and so they don't, um, they, they don't agree with the Second Vatican Council, and they um, don't have full submission to the Roman Pontiff. They're very faithful in many other um, regards, but because they are not in submission to the Supreme Pontiff, as we heard about in that definition of what schism is, um, they are not in the full, perfect communion with the Catholic Church. But there has been a lot of work to unite them with the Catholic Church, from Pope Paul VI, Pope John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and Pope Francis, they've all been working to make strides to bring them into the Catholic Church. For the time being, their sacraments are valid but illicit. Um, it is, with reconciliation and marriage, those are sacraments that require faculties from the bishop to be given to priests in order for it to be um, not only illicit but also valid. And so, um, that is another sticking point. But, on the other hand, if you go to Maryville, to the Institute of uh, Christ the King Sovereign Priest, celebrated at the Salvatorian Monastery, that is a similar group that also celebrates the Latin Mass, but they are in full communion with the Catholic Church, and so their sacraments are both valid and listed. I'm just going to be with these several uh, quotes from the Vatican Council that are very important to this whole um, this whole matter of the church. The document on the church, it said, the church is necessary for salvation. Whosoever, therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter or to remain in it, 
could not be saved. Then in the documents um, on ecumenism, the Vatican Council wrote, the children who are born into these separated communities and who grow up believing in Christ cannot be accused of the sin involved in the separation. And the Catholic Church embraces upon them as brothers with respect and affection. For men who believe in Christ and have been truly baptized are in communion with the Catholic Church, even though this communion is imperfect. Another similar quote from the Catechism. It states that there are many elements of sanctification and of truth that are found outside of the visible confines of the Catholic Church. And so this would be things like baptism and the scriptures within Protestantism. And finally, Vatican Council, uh, on its documents on the church, wrote, they are fully incorporated in the society of the church who accepts her entire system and all the means of salvation given to her and are united with her as part of her visible bodily structure. The bonds which bind men to Christ in a visible way are the profession of faith, the sacraments, and ecclesiastical government and community. And so that is what it takes to be a full community in the church that Christ established. The profession of faith, what we believe, the creed, the seven sacraments, and thirdly, the hierarchy, the leadership structure that Christ established, the college of bishops um, led by the successor of Peter. And so just to go back from where we started, that the reason why God has created humanity is so that we might share his own blessed life. And when this union was lost through the fall, through sin, God began this process of intervening to bring humanity back into communion with God. This climax with Jesus and Christ, who established the Catholic Church, founded upon the rock of Peter, surrounded by the other 12 apostles. And now we live in this age of our response to that, um, that every human being who has lived since then has this choice to make of entering through, through baptism into the gates of the church, this ark of Noah that is sailing through the waters of the world into eternal life. And so the one the church that Christ established has those four marks. And this is the simple way of knowing which is the true church that Christ established. It is one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. And we see through the church's history uh, the need for apostolic succession, for the successor of Peter, because this is where the magisterium comes in, the teaching authority. Um, and St. Vincent of Larens wrote in that quote that as, for as many interpreters there are, there's going to be a different interpretation. And so we need one head to be able to determine these differences when a problem arises. So, I hope that's enough for you to chew on for the rest of your life. And uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me now or see me at another time. There's a question. Right here. Any question? No. No. Someone is baptized but not confirmed. What are they? Well, there's a lot of ambiguity in that. Depends where they're baptized and what they've done since baptism. Um, so I don't know if you have any more specifics on that. <coughs> okay. Um, well, they, as long as they haven't renounced the faith, they would still be uh, Catholic. Um, you know, the confirmation is the sacraments of. Um, you know, strengthening for full maturity. It makes us into soldiers for Christ. Prepares us for that missionary activity. So, a person not receiving baptism doesn't mean they're a heretic, but it is one of those, um, the fullness of the means of salvation that Christ has given us. So, one should receive baptism if someone is intentionally, or confirmation, if someone's intentionally not receiving it, then there's certainly a question there of, of why. 
And if they are, you know, rejecting um, one of the core beliefs of the church, that would be fall into the you know, technical term of heresy, um, which doesn't necessarily depends on on what the matter is that they're rejecting, but it could separate someone from uh, full perfect communion with the Church of Christ. More questions? Oh, yeah. Well, let us listen, please. Because I would think illicit and invalid would be synonyms. Mm, yeah, it's a, those are technical terms. So um, basically, it's kind of like, you know, valid means that the bare minimum for um, the sacrament to take place has taken place. So, with regard to the Mass, um, if you didn't pronounce, say, the words of institution, um, or if you change them in such a way, that they had a, the substance of them was changed, that would make it invalid. But if you um, maybe you forget to say like the Lord be with you at a certain point, that would make it illicit but not invalid. So illicit pertains to those things of like a lesser matter, um, but it doesn't make the whole sacrament invalid. Um, but you should never omit something to make something illicit. Illicit doesn't mean that you should just these are things we can just kind of be willy-nilly with. Um, no, we have to do everything that the church, uh, you know, gives us um, in terms of, um, you know, the rights. But um, if something of a smaller matter is omitted or done by mistake, that would make the thing illicit. Um, but if you leave out or change somewhat is really poor, that's when something becomes invalid. Um, but not only are the actual words and actions of how you perform a sacrament uh, pertain to validity and lasciety, but also who the minister is, who the recipient is, um, you know, other things with regards to the preparation for that sacrament. Um, so, like with regard to marriage, um, marriage is one of the most complicated sacraments, uh, but it would not be valid if a priest does not have delegation to perform that sacrament. Um, and so that's why usually a, a pastor is the one who um, is able to marry his, the people that reside within his, um, his geographical territory. And if it's anyone else other than the pastor, they need, a special, they need permission from the pastor um, in order to permission. Um, not usually, I don't think it's from the bishop, although I'm not a canon lawyer, but it's usually from the pastor. Yeah. So Jan knows. We, we just we just got it to see it and vouch for this. There's a priest who's gonna do a wedding in a couple of weeks, and we got a letter from the first diocese of Chicago saying that he is a valid priest, but then Father Kai also had to write a letter giving permission for that priest to perform that wedding at the Yeah. It doesn't have anything to do with the bishop. It's the Archdiocese of Chicago and Father. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, thank you, Father Zach, for giving us this time this evening, for sure. I have, I have two questions. Okay, the first question is, when we recite the, the creed, we say, Holy Catholic and es Espatolic Church. When you say, is that referring, you know, that's not capitalized, you know, the C, typically, is that just, is that really towards our faith to the Catholic Church? So, I actually read something in preparation for this talk exactly on that topic. And um, the author was pointing out that um, he had the section of the book where he went through uses of the term Catholic in the very early church. Um, and I didn't include it in, in my talk, but one of the things that he said, his argument is that the way the word is used in the early church, the word Catholic, it's used, um, this whole distinction between like big C, small C Catholic is a, is a modern you know, distinction. Um, but even if that's, um, you know, it can, there's an a valid argument for having both of those um, uh, connotations of the one word Catholic. Um, 
but he argues that the authors mean uh, both of the terms when they use it. Um, so there was one from, uh, I forget exactly the church father, but it was like in the very early 100s, he used the term uh, Catholic church. That, that was actually, that was the first use of, that we have um, that's extent in writings of the word Catholic within the church. Um, but the way the author uses it, it's clear that it's already been defined and in usage ahead of that time. So we know that the word Catholic was being used with regard to the church even in the very first century. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have any of the quotes from uh, that within my talk, but yeah, basically we should, um, as, I, as I said, the word Catholic means universal or according to the whole. And so, um, uh, like, okay, here's a really good one from St. Augustine. St. Augustine, he once wrote, and this is, you know, one of the most well-respected church fathers, maybe the most important theologian in all of, all of Catholic history, and interestingly, also someone that's accepted by um, the Protestants. He, he famously wrote that, I would not believe in the gospel if the Catholic Church did not move me to do so. And so there it is very clear that he has a physical um, institution envisioned when he uses the word Catholic Church. There. He's saying that I would not believe in the gospel if the Catholic Church did not move me to do so. Um, and there are other very powerful quotes of a similar nature. If you want to talk more later, I can certainly send you some of those. All right, and then he you. lived in the 400s. Thank you for that. And the second question I have is there, I mean, you mentioned so much stuff tonight that I just didn't know. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the second question I have is I heard you say something like in the late 100s or the early 200s is when, when Jesus established the Orthodox Church. If I heard that right. Uh, I might have said something like that, but I, yes. I mean, it, Orthodox, the literal, you know, term, um, basically means right belief. That's the literal etymological meaning of that. Um, and so, what we have, what we know today as the Orthodox Church, the institution that goes by that name, you know, the reason they use it is because they're, they're, they believe and they're stating that we have the uh, right belief. Um, now, we, there's a lot of similarities in belief, as I already mentioned, between the Catholic and Orthodox churches, that there's a little, little separating them from the full communion. Um, and so, in terms of belief, they're not really much different than the Catholic faith. But there's a, the word of Orthodox, um, you know, has a, a, a literal meaning, like the word Catholic does, according to the whole and right belief. Um, so, I, I think I did say that. I remember they saying something about, you know, this is the Orthodox faith, but I mean it in the literal uh, connotation of the word. Any more questions? Just, just one question. Okay. Uh, let's say I'm someplace uh, on vacation and there are no Catholic churches to support my obligation, but there is a Easter church that's in communion. Or, or, uh, or an Orthodox church. If I attended there, would that set aside my Sunday application or would I be in mortal sin? So with regard to the Eastern Catholic churches, there's no question that that's you know, absolutely perfectly fine. Because um, they're in full communion with the Catholic Church. Um, you know, at my seminary where I had several uh, Cyril Malabar seminar seminarians, um, and at my other seminary I had some from the uh, another another rite. You know, they would attend you know, our masses every single day. Like, there's no um, you know difference in commun communion or you know, belief um, within those the Eastern Catholic churches. Now, with regard to the Eastern Orthodox churches, um, the Catholic Church has said, um, because, so within the past century, there's been this whole ecumenical movement um, trying to uh, have more unity in Christianity.
Christianity, ultimately working to um, you know one common church, as there was for you know the first millennium. Um, and so one of the things that the Catholic Church has stated with regard to the Orthodox churches is that um, it's uh, in an emergency they will you know allow. Uh, I don't have it the quote you know, quite summarized, but basically they will allow the Orthodox to receive the sacraments within the Catholic Church, um, you know, even fully communion. Um, but I do not think that the Eastern Orthodox Church has reciprocated that belief. So I think from the Catholic Church's perspective, it would still fulfill your Sunday obligation to go there. And from the Catholic Church, you, uh, you could receive holy communion there. Whether their minister would would like you to receive Holy Communion from their perspective is another question. Um, and generally speaking, I would think the answer is no from their perspective. Any more questions? So Father, the, the Catholic Catholic Church, which is in Egypt, um, I believe they're in Community, so I believe that's, that's where the Eastern branch is. Um, I was traveling with my dad, and I kind of went to Mass on Sunday. Uh, is that what I'm the rest of this? I took it out of this final copy because my notes were already so long. But um, I, I believe, I mean, I, I do recognize the name of Coptic Church. Um, I would have to double check to, I don't have the 23 numbers. Yeah. Unfortunately, I just deleted that from this copy. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Because I know the priest is probably tired already. So let me do the closing prayer before we, uh, you say our thank yous, okay? So we're going to repeat the prayer I began with. If you, if you could repeat after me. Lord, increase our faith. Lord, increase our faith. Okay. Do you want to add any other prayer? Sure. I would just like to, yeah, you can get there. Um, thank everyone for coming to this talk. I hope that you find it helpful not only for your knowledge but also for your own salvation and your own um, apostolate and ministry um, within the world helping to, to reconcile more people um, to God that we might share in his own blessed life. Um, so I'll, I'll just conclude this with the prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God our Father, we thank you for um, the intervention through which you have brought us back to you giving us the sacraments of baptism by which we are forgiven of our sin and become adopted children of Him. Lord, we ask that um, through this talk this evening, through this study, that you would bring us closer to you, that we might know you more and therefore love you more. And we ask you to bless all of us as we travel home this evening. Um, we have safe travels and bless all of our families and our loved ones as we continue to minister to them. We ask all of this in Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. So before you leave, we want to remind you of a few things. Um, we always graciously accept your goodwill offering to ensure our ministry can continue to offer amazing speakers. Remember that if you've been enjoying our series, all past events can be viewed on our YouTube channel. Although we might have had some technical difficulties with recording today. So hopefully. Mm -hmm. Lastly, thank you to Jess Alcimos and the entire staff for graciously making room for us and accepting the staff of open arms. And we already closed with the prayer. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank oh, next week. Next week. October 9th, Wednesday, is Father Dave, David Kine, and he's going to speak about orders. Orders in the church. Thank you.